Okay, if I could have your attention, let me talk to you a second. Dr. Allen has some books out on a table out here, and uh, I'm going to have him show you the books, and if you will, and talk to him, explain to him what they are. Uh, that way he knows more about his books than I do. But, but he does have some books out there that you can acquire uh, that may help you uh, go a little deeper into some of this as if we're not deep enough already, okay? In your pew rack in front of you, all right, is a love offering envelope. Now, since COVID started, we have not been collecting an offering through the plates, so you just can put it in one of the boxes. But uh, I would ask you to prayerfully consider, you know, giving to uh, Dr. Allen's ministry. Uh, he has a ministry. He is a, a professor there at the seminary, but he has a, a ministry also where he is working with preachers. And uh, but you give to him. And I know that he'll greatly appreciate that. We'll see that all of that goes to him directly. So please take one of these offering envelopes. You can give tonight or tomorrow night, whichever it may be. I want to pray for us before we start, and then uh, I think Luke's going to lead us in a song. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our time together. And Lord, I pray now that you would open our hearts and our minds to the truth that's being communicated. And Lord, that you would give us a passion, Lord, about... Uh, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And Lord, help us to stand firm in the beliefs that we have. Pray for Dr. Allen tonight as you use him, Lord, to teach us. Lord, uh, uh, we pray that you would give him the words and the understanding, Lord, to communicate that to us. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing on the promises of God. You may be seated. I had to get you right there. <laughs> okay, well, you're back for part two. <laughs> so, welcome back. The pastor mentioned the books that are on the table there. And uh, so, let me say a brief word about each one of them. And uh, number one, there is the book called Whosoever Will. That's the title of the conference that we're having. Uh, this is a book that was the result of a conference like this that was held uh, back in 2008 at uh, First Baptist Church of Woodstock, Georgia, where Johnny Hunt is the, was the pastor at that time. And uh, there were a number of us who were involved in making presentations on uh, a traditional understanding of Southern Baptist uh, soteriology, the fancy word for the doctrine of salvation. And a part of that conference was a critique of Calvinism. 
And all of the papers that were delivered at that conference, including mine on the subject of limited atonement, is uh, there in this book. The first five chapters uh, are, well, after a sermon in here, there's an introduction, and then there's a sermon in here by Jerry Vines on John 3.16, and then there are chapters on the five points of Calvinism, a critique of each of those points. We're going to talk about those today. Total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. And so there's a chapter that critiques each of those uh, biblically. All right? And then there are some chapters in the back half of the book, by, again by just individual authors, on the subjects like the potential impact of Calvinistic tendencies on local Baptist churches. What about the public invitation in Calvinism? What about divine determinism and human freedom? So our subject earlier is a big part of that, of that chapter. What about evil and God's sovereignty? How does the fact that God is sovereign over all things relate to the fact that there's evil in the world? Uh, these are all chapters that are in this book. Uh, you will find this very helpful. It's a scholarly work, but not, but not overly technical. Uh, there are a lot of footnotes uh, for further research if you want to. But uh, I do highly recommend uh, this book right here. And if I remember, I think we're doing this one for $15. It's normally $25, but I believe that's correct on this one. The second book is entitled, Anyone Can Be Saved. This, by the way, the Whosoever Will book, I edited this with Dr. Steve Lemke, who is a professor at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Anyone Can Be Saved is subtitled, The Defense of Traditional Southern Baptist Soteriology. This book was published back in 2016, uh, after the, along about 2013, there was a panel or there was a, a group of Baptists who got together and produced kind of a doctrinal statement on uh, traditional non-Calvinism in Baptist life. And then this book is a multi-author book. I edited along with Eric Hankins and Dr. Adam Harwood, and the three of us edited this. And I have a chapter in this book as well as the introduction. And there were 10 articles in that, in that statement that was published on what we believe as non-Calvinists. And there's a chapter on each one of those articles, and it's a very simple read and a very clear read, about 10 different authors involved here. And uh, I think, uh, I don't remember what I, whatever I tell you on the price, it's on the table out there. If I told you wrong, my apologies. But I think that one's $10. Number three, I have a book on the atonement. Uh, this book is titled The Atonement, A Biblical, Theological, and Historical Study of the Cross of Christ. And it covers all aspects of the atonement in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the necessity of the atonement, the nature of the atonement, historical theories of how the atonement works through church history, as well as limited atonement, unlimited atonement, and what are the problems uh, with limited atonement. All of that is in this book. This book normally sells for $35, and uh, I think this is the one that's $25, if I remember, out there. Uh, but this will be a very helpful book on the subject of the atonement. Some of the things I talked about today, about propitiation, right, those kinds of things, uh, that's all in this book here. Number four, this is my book that just came out last week, has nothing to do with Calvinism, <laughs> nothing to do with that. This is a little commentary for Bible teachers and preachers on Job. It's called Exalting Jesus in Job. Here's how to preach and teach Job. Uh, and it's about 240 pages. It's non-technical. It would be great for Sunday school teachers or just people that are interested in studying the book of Job. But it's also designed for pastors who are preaching a series through Job. And uh, so uh, this one's available out there as well. This one is uh, $10 and, uh, as well. Now... Pastor, I'm, I'm going to give you copies of all these. Just don't let me forget. You, I want you to go out there and you pick out all four of those. I'm giving you those because you're the pastor and you invited me to come. I'm grateful to be here. And so I'm going to give you copies of all of these. So I want to make sure you don't walk out and forget that. I wish I could afford to do that for all of you, but I can't. I can't do that. But I can let you have these books at my cost, which is what we're doing. Uh, and we're, uh, so they're all less than what you see on the price on the back. So, a little crass commercial there, but uh, sorry about that, but wanted to say a word to you about that. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, yeah, there's some other books I have that I didn't bring. I have a commentary on the book of Hebrews in the New American Commentary series, 
Uh, you can buy any of my books, by the way, on Amazon, uh, or most of my books are published through Brahman Holman or B&H Academic, uh, Lifeway, the Southern Baptist publishing arm, and most of my stuff you can get there. But I do have a commentary on Hebrews. I've also got a little series of sermons on 1st through 3rd John published by Crossway called Fellowship in the Family. 1st through 3rd John, Fellowship in the Family. It's in the Preach the Word series, and those are all sermons. And my sermon this morning is in that book. Uh, from start to finish, introduction, the body, and the conclusion, all the illustrations that I used are in that book, along with 19 other sermons on 1 John. Uh, just sermons all the way through 1 John. That book is available. Now, for those of you that really want to study deeply in the subject that we're going to cover tomorrow, which is the extent of the atonement, I have a big book, 842 pages, on, and that's the title, The Extent of the Atonement. It took me 10 years to write it. It is a study of the question of the extent of the atonement historically and doctrinally from the early church fathers through, uh, 19, uh, through uh, 2015. It has uh, three chapters in there on Baptists and the extent of the atonement. English Baptist, Northern Baptist, and then Southern Baptist. There's an entire chapter on the history of the, the debate on the extent of the atonement in the Southern Baptist Convention from 1845 to the present. But then there's a, a chapter at the very end uh, where I present uh, all of the arguments and evidence for why I think unlimited atonement is the biblical view. Now that book is long, about three-fourths of it is historical. So if you're interested in history, if you want to know what did Augustine say about that, or, you know, what did John Calvin say? I've got 50 pages on John Calvin. By the way, John Calvin never taught limited atonement. I'll tell you about that tomorrow. But uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in that book if you're just interested in that kind of thing. Now, if you're not, I want to tell you two things about that book. Number one, if you suffer from insomnia, then you start reading this book about 1030 at night and it'll solve your problem, okay? Number two, have you got a window that won't stay open? Okay, this book is an excellent window stopper, all right, window holder. Number three, if you need a door stop, this book is 842 pages and it weighs a ton and it'll keep your door open. And so if you've got any one of those three issues, this book would be worth the price just for that, all right? Help you with all of those things. So I do have some other books out. I've got a book that I... Uh, edited on the return of Christ, a premillennial understanding of the second coming of Christ. That book is out. Uh, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, uh, yeah, in addition to my commentary on Hebrews, I have a book out on the authorship of Hebrews where I argue that Luke, who wrote Luke and Acts, is also the author of Hebrews. And that is a revision of my Ph.D. dissertation. I did my Ph.D. dissertation on the authorship of Hebrews at the University of Texas at a secular school. But I had a Christian, PhD, a Christian uh, professor there, and, uh, and I studied in the field of linguistics at the University of Texas at Arlington, and I actually wrote my dissertation comparing Luke, Acts, and Hebrews and concluding that Paul did not write Hebrews, uh, that Luke did. You know the book of Hebrews is the only truly anonymous book in the New Testament. We know who wrote all the others. But Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. There's no statement of who the author is in the book of Hebrews. It's an anonymous book, and I'm arguing that stylistically, with the language and, and style, that Luke is the most likely author of Hebrews. So there's a lot of fun stuff there if you're interested in that, too. Uh, so I don't know, I've got about a dozen books that I've either written or, or co-authored. These are four, I've got about eight others. I didn't, I didn't bring all of them, send any or all of them, but... You know, if you're interested in any of those there, you can get any or all of those through Amazon.com. Uh, so, okay. Well, uh, thank you for the crash commercial. Now, go to page number three on that handout. Let's talk about unconditional election. And before we do talk about that, let's begin. Let me remind you or refresh your memory on the issue of uh, or what's called the five points of Calvinism, right? Now, I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, 
But this became a real big debate. The rise of what's called Calvinism and Arminianism is a 17th century uh, situation, uh, event. And so in the 17th century, in the 1600s, after the Reformation of the 1500s, uh, into the early 1600s, uh, you began to have debates among the Calvinists with those who were originally Calvinists but who felt like Calvinism was moving to an extreme and they ultimately were became known as Arminians. Arminius, Jacob Arminius, was a Calvinist or was Reformed and uh, he felt like that uh, some of these issues were pushing too far and so he kind of came back a little bit and he had a lot of followers and that created a dissension and they had a council, the Council of Dort, uh, 1518 to 19 and codified what today is generally understood as uh, the five points of Calvinism, though they weren't called that until the early 20th century. That's another interesting story all of its own. Everybody thinks the five points of Calvinism goes back to the Synod of Dort. It does not. It's a 20th century invention or acrostic. And so the acrostic that is used today popularly to describe the beliefs of Calvinism is the tulip acrostic all right now this is in the other handout you have Calvinism and extended the atonement so we're going to get to that tomorrow but I, and so this is in here though if you want to flip over and look at that along about page two the tulip acrostics on the bottom of page two all right here it is total depravity unconditional election limited atonement irresistible grace perseverance of the saints these five statements, each one beginning with the letter T-U-L-I-P, the tulip acrostic is a memory device uh, to describe the so-called five points of Calvinism that were codified at Dort and later, 30 years later, at the Westminster Assembly as well in London and that have been the traditional ways of describing what Calvinists believe. Now, we're about to talk about unconditional election, but in order to understand that, let's talk briefly about total depravity, all right? The Bible clearly teaches that all people are sinners by nature and then by choice. No Orthodox Christian can deny that. It doesn't matter whether you're Calvinist, non-Calvinist, Lutheran, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, all Christians believe, all Orthodox Christians believe that every human being born is born with a sin nature. And then as they get old enough to make decisions and choices, they choose sinful actions. So we are sinners by nature and we are sinners by choice. That's what generally described, that's what generally describes the term total depravity. So in one sense, all Orthodox Christians believe in total depravity. What they don't believe is each other's definitions of what the Bible teaches about total depravity. So you're not going to find the term total depravity in the Bible. But the concept is there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one who is righteous. No, not one. The thoughts and, my, and attitudes of the heart, God said in Noah's day to Noah, God saw that it was only evil continually. These are all examples of many kinds of verses that we could give to describe the concept of total depravity. Now, what Calvinists believe about total depravity is that entailed in that definition is therefore total inability. So that mankind, humanity, is totally depraved and thus morally incapable of, by that total depravity, of exercising faith in Christ unless God grants the gift of faith to you. Because remember, in Calvinism, you don't have free will, right? It's a deterministic situation. So total depravity, according to Calvinism, teaches that you are sinners by nature, sinners by choice, we all agree with that, but that the nature of total depravity is such that you do not have the moral ability to believe in Christ unless God grants you that gift of faith. And unless God grants you that gift of faith, you would never believe because of total depravity. You cannot believe 
unless God gives you the gift of faith because you don't have free will. Even when the gospel comes, the gospel itself, apart from the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and God giving you the gift of faith, you, can, you wouldn't be saved. Total depravity prohibits it. So Calvinists believe in what is called total inability. Total depravity equals total inability. A moral inability to believe the gospel apart from God granting you the gift of faith and God regenerating you such that you will believe when you are regenerated. And thus most Calvinists affirm what is called regeneration precedes faith. Not all. There's a minority of Calvinists who reject that because they read the Bible and they say, yeah, Lee, it's pretty hard. You know, the Bible tends to say faith and then regeneration. And, but Calvinism uh, as a doctrinal system, usually most Calvinists affirm regeneration preceding faith. Logically, and even chronologically, though they say it's a nanosecond, you know, from uh, regeneration and then you have faith. Uh, most would argue that, though some would say there can be a period of time in between the two. Again, Calvinists are not monolithic. Keep that in mind. And therefore, total depravity means total inability. And therefore, unless God gives you the gift of faith, nobody would believe. Unless God regenerates you and grants you supernaturally the gift of faith, you would not believe. That's total depravity. Now, that leads Calvinism to teach unconditional election. That's where we are now. So that unless God unconditionally chooses some people to be saved, then according to Calvinism, nobody would be saved. Because by definition, total depravity makes it impossible for anybody to believe the gospel by virtue of the nature of sin and human depravity and the lack of libertarian freedom. You don't have libertarian freedom. And therefore, you have the moral incapacity to believe. You can't believe. You won't believe and you can't believe uh, unless God grants you regeneration and the gift of faith. Now, therefore, because that's true, Calvinism argues, what God does is He chooses by His grace some people that God is going to save. And he elects some to be saved. He predestines some people to be saved. Now the question is, well, what criteria does God use to choose whom he will save? And all Calvinists will tell you, you can't know that. The Bible doesn't say. That's in the imponderables of God. You just can't know. It is unconditional because it's not based on anything God knows will be true of any of His elect once they are born and living their lives in time. It's not based on what they don't do or what they do or how sinful they are or how good they are. It's not based on any of that. God just arbitrarily chooses some people for reasons known only to Him. Calvinists will say, I'm sure God has His reasons, but God never tells us His reasons. So there are people out there that God has chosen and those are the people, the elect. And God chose those people before eternity or, or in eternity past before creation such that God determined of all people that would come that would be born in this world, God determined before they were born who would, who would be saved, whom He would grant the gift of faith to and others so-called non-elect, otherwise known in Calvinistic theology as the reprobate. That's a theological term to describe the non-elect, the reprobate, those who will not believe. Why? Because God doesn't grant them the gift of faith to believe, and therefore they won't believe, and thus they are the non-elect. Thus they'll be born, live, and die, and they will not be saved. All right? So Calvinism teaches that election is unconditional by nature, that it is not conditioned on anything, including foreseen faith. Calvinists reject the idea 
that election is based on foreseen faith. So that God, who knows all things, we're going to talk about foreknowledge in a moment, God obviously knows everything that's going to occur. He wouldn't be God if he didn't. So God foreknows everything that's going to happen in time. He foreknows all of that before it happens. But God does not determine who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved on the basis of what he foreknows they will do when they hear the gospel. So he does not base his decision of election on foreseen faith. All right? That is Calvinism. God doesn't base his election on anything. God's choice is God's choice because he can choose who he wants to save and you and I have no grounds to quarrel with God if he chooses to save that person and not you. And that is, that is the Calvinistic doctrine of unconditional election. Now, you say, well, that sounds harsh. Well, because it is harsh. But don't believe me, let me quote John Calvin. All right, so you'll notice right there in your handout at the top of page 3. Listen to Calvin. By predestination, we mean the eternal decree of God by which he determined with himself whatever he wished to happen with regard to every man. All are not created on equal terms. Some are preordained to eternal life, others to eternal damnation. And accordingly, as each has been created for one or other of these ends, we say that he has been predestinated to life or to death. End of quote. Now, for those of you who are my Calvinist brothers and sisters, I want to remind you, that's not David Allen, that's John Calvin. I'm just reading from the horse's mouth. This is the doctrine of Calvinism today. This is what Calvinism affirms. Now notice the other quote from Calvin. Some are predestinated to salvation, others to damnation. Regarding the loss, it was God, His, capital H, His good pleasure to doom to destruction. Since the disposition of all things is in the hands of God, He can give life or death at His pleasure. He dispenses and ordains by His judgment that some from their mother's womb are destined irrevocably to eternal death in order to glorify His name in their perdition. End of quote. Now I'm going to tell you what that means. It ain't pretty. What Calvin is saying is that when God determines before somebody is born that they are going to be in hell forever, God makes that determination as a part of the way to glorify His own name. Now you need to understand that's what Calvin says. Now, so as a result of this, to put it in R.C. Sproul's words, faith is a necessary condition for salvation, but not for election. Reformed theology sees faith as the result of election. Election comes first. God elects in eternity past. Then he gives faith, he grants faith to his elect in time. And so your election to salvation is in eternity past. But the gift of faith and regeneration so you can exercise that faith is the gift that God gives in time. This is what Sproul is saying in his book. Now, there are not a lot of passages, I say a lot, there are a few actually passages that Calvinists turn to to try to argue this doctrine of unconditional election. Now, by the way, there are other ways those of us who are non-Calvinists are going to answer all this, right? We're just not there yet. I want to give you what the Calvinist is teaching and then we'll come back and we'll talk about alternative ways of understanding the doctrine of election. So Calvinists often appeal to Romans chapter 9 as evidence for unconditional election. And in Romans 9, you have in Romans 9 verses 6 and following, verses 6 through 13, is usually the passage that they go to. And here it is, I printed it out for you. Now, it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. Neither is it the case that all of Abraham's children are actually his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. Now, remember, Abraham had another, had another son, right, Ishmael, but God did not choose to trace the Messianic line through Ishmael. God chose Isaac. 
So notice that we're talking about corporate, corporate issues here, Ishmael and his descendants, Isaac and his descendants, and later in the chapter, the Gentile, the non-Jew. So, verse 8. That is, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. Verse 9. For this is the statement of the promise. Now he's quoting. At this time I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not yet been born, yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, Jacob, but I have hated Esau. Now from those verses is derived the concept of unconditional election. Now those verses don't teach unconditional election. Now the Calvinist, of course, says, well, well of course it does. It's right there. It's clear as the nose on your face. God chose one. He chose Jacob and he rejected Esau. He chose one and he didn't choose the other. And therefore they affirm that this means he chooses some people for salvation and others not for salvation. But look at the text carefully. Notice the text does not say that for her sons in verse 11, uh, for though her sons had not been born yet and neither had done anything good or bad, but so that God's purpose according to election might stand, not from works, but from the one who calls. Look, she was told, the older will be saved and the younger damned. Oh, is that what it says? No, what does it say? Right there, black and white, in your Bible. Don't even believe what I've written. If you don't trust me, look at your Bible. What does it say in verse 12? The older will serve the younger. There's nothing about personal salvation in this text. Calvinists are reading that into the text. They're taking what is a corporate issue, the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob. Uh, Paul is speaking corporately. And then they are saying, but he's also speaking individually. And this is an argument for individual election, for unconditional election. All Calvinists, by the way, affirm that. This is one area where all Calvinists are lockstep. There is no Calvinist who does not believe that Romans 9 teaches unconditional election. There is no Calvinist who does not believe unconditional election. To put it the other way, all Calvinists affirm unconditional election, period. If you do not affirm unconditional election, you are not a Calvinist. All right? Is everybody clear on that? Now, Calvinists also appeal to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ Jesus. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. To whom is Paul writing, saved people or unsaved people? Now, let's, oh, okay, whoa, wait a minute, time out. Okay, I didn't get a, much of a response on that. That makes me nervous. Because this should be crystal clear. I'm going to ask it again. Is Paul writing to saved people or is he writing to unsaved people in Ephesians? He's writing to saved people, right. And he's talking about saved people. God who has blessed us, he chose us in him. Now watch it. Does it say he chose us to be in him? Does it say he chose us to be saved? No, it says he chose us in the sphere of in Christ Jesus. When did he do that? He did do that before the foundation of the world. But what was the choosing? Look at the rest of the statement. Does it say he chose you to be saved? No, it does not. It says he chose you to be holy and blameless in love before him. You are not chosen in that text to salvation. You are chosen to be blameless and, uh, and you are chosen to be before him in love. You are not chosen to salvation. You are chosen to the benefits of salvation after you are saved. 
the text itself does not say you are chosen to be in Christ. Number three, Calvinist appeal to Romans 8, verses 29. There's a print, misprint there. It should say 829-30, not 839-30. Sorry. Romans 8, 29 and 30 as evidence of unconditional election. For those he foreknew, he also predestined. Watch it now. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be saved. Is that what it said? No. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And not only that, who did he predestine? People he what? Foreknew. Now wait a minute. Calvinism teaches that unconditional election is not based on anything God foreknows. But this text says... There's something God foreknew, those he foreknew are the ones he predestined. Now the argument here is what is it God foreknew? And the Calvinist argues that foreknowledge here is another way of saying foreordination, that God or for God foreloved. It's the concept of God loves those whom he's chosen. He loved you before time, and therefore he predestined you. But the word actually means foreknow, to know ahead of time. And so notice what you're, you're predestined to. Here's the word predestined. What is it you're predestined to? To be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified. Those he justified, what did he also do? He also what? Glorified. Now wait a minute. At the time Paul wrote that to living Christians in Rome, all right, had they been justified? Yes. Had they been sanctified? Yes. Had they been glorified? Not yet. But what is it they are predestined to? To be glorified. Romans 8, 28, 9, and 30 is one of the strongest statements about the eternal security of the believer. That once you are truly saved, you can never lose your salvation because God's decree is that everybody who is truly saved, everybody who, who is in Christ Jesus is predestined. Your destiny is beforehand told. You are predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. When does final conformity to the image of Jesus in the Bible occur? It occurs at glorification when you get to heaven. You're in the process of being conformed now. The doctrine that we refer to there is called sanctification. But you are ultimately sanctified when you are glorified. But glorification does not occur when you're on this earth. It occurs when you get to heaven. And so my point is that all of these texts that Calvinists use to teach unconditional election actually don't teach unconditional election at all. And they're actually teaching something else. And by the way, note the use of foreknow connected with predestination, as I mentioned. So, non-Calvinist on page 4 reject unconditional election. We don't think that's biblical. There are several reasons we don't think it's biblical beyond what I've already said. We believe that unconditional election is contrary to God's revelation of His nature. Because we believe that if unconditional election is true, the key word there, unconditional, not based on anything you do or don't do. If that's true, then how is it that God can be somehow not guilty of showing partiality to those people whom he's elected? How can the justice of God be upheld as God's revealed himself as a just God, how can God said to be just if he arbitrarily chooses some to save and some to let them go to hell? Those of us who are non-Calvinists believe that is a violation of God's very nature. It is a violation of God's love. It is a violation of what Scripture teaches about God's justice and God's love. And those are among the biblical reasons why we reject unconditional election. We do not believe unconditional election has biblical foundation. Among other things, we believe it is contrary to the nature of God. How can God be said to be a God of love who does this, who operates this way? 
Our law courts don't operate this way. If we did, you wouldn't have any justice. But the communists, of course, say, oh, yes, but see, this is different. God's God. He can do what he wants. And, and they love to go back to Romans 9 and use what Paul says. But who are you, O man, to talk back to God? But that's a misuse of that text as well. Paul is not talking about unconditional election. Calvinists argue that he is. Everybody else in, in the orbit of Christianity, all Eastern Orthodox, all, Cal, all Catholic, and all non-Calvinist, which is everybody outside of the Reformed faith, right? People who are non-Calvinistic Baptists, all Methodists, all uh, Lutherans, all Assemblies of God, all anybody else who's not a Calvinist, just name their denomination, and they all say, no, this is not how election works. Calvinists argue it this way. Everybody else does it. Everybody else sees it differently. So, there are some other ways to view it. One is called uh, corporate election. The concept of Ephesians 1, 3 through 4 says that God has chosen us in Him. Jesus is God's elect, and all who are in Christ are among the elect because they're in Jesus. Their salvation is determined to be final salvation, and they're going to make it to glorification. Why? Because Philippians 1, 6, He who began a good work in you will complete it at the day of Christ. And this is a notion that's called corporate election. So individuals who are saved are saved by virtue of grace through faith in Christ, but then they are in Christ Jesus, and all who are corporately in Christ Jesus are referred to as the elect. And so this is the concept of corporate election. Now there's no question this kind of election is taught in the Old Testament. All election in the Old Testament is, is uh, corporate. And then there's another method or another interpretation that you can take, verse, uh, page 5. Election is based on or in accordance with foreseen faith. This is contrary to uh, Calvinism. You've got some non-Calvinists who affirm corporate election. You have other non-Calvinists who affirm election according to foreseen faith. All of the first 350, sorry, the first, uh, yeah, 350 years from A.D. 100 to uh, uh, A.D. 3, late 300s, early 400s with Augustine. So for 300 years, all of the early church fathers, virtually all of them held to this understanding of election. God chose those he foreknew would believe in Christ. They are the elect. And that is a legitimate interpretation of Romans 8 and 2 Peter 2, 1 and Ephesians 1, 4 and 5. That is the viewpoint that says election does indeed have to do with salvation. So here, non-Calvinists, Arminians particularly who hold this view, agree with Calvinists that whatever election is, it's electing people to salvation. Calvinists believe it occurs unconditionally Arminians and other non-Calvinists argue that it occurs in accordance with foreseen faith. So now this is, not, this is not identical to corporate election. Now we're in another kind of election. Election is corporate, one, that's one option. Another option is it's based on foreseen faith. So you've got two different options in the non-Calvinist world. So now you've got three ways of interpreting the concept of election at least three ways unconditional election that's calvinism corporate election that's non-calvinism understanding election to be corporate those who are in christ and personal election to salvation which is based on foreseen faith those are three options and then i gave you really option number four that sal that election has nothing to do with to be saved election has everything to do with those who are saved and that election and predestination concerns final salvation and glorification. So now you got a fourth possibility. So, you've got choices there. One of those choices is the Reformed choice, the Calvinistic interpretation. The other three are interpretations held by various non-Calvinists. Right? So, 
I believe that all three of those have, pers- you, can, you can make a case for all three of those, but my personal leaning is the corporate, I think the corporate concept is true, and I think ultimately election and predestination is to the benefits of salvation. It's not to salvation. It's rather to glorification. That's where I personally stand on this. But you'll have to determine how do you interpret this. Different people read this and interpret it different ways. All right? So let's talk briefly about predestination and foreknowledge in the 15 minutes we have left, and then we'll do Q&A. So predestination, notice the notes. The issue that is often missed in the discussion of election is how one becomes elect. In the Calvinist model, the elect are those who are selected by God for salvation. Other Christians regard election as God's choice of the conditions of salvation. God says repentance of sin and faith in Christ must occur for you to be among the elect, or his choice of a people, those who freely repent and believe. This is the corporate notion of election, but not individuals. Now, the Greek word behind predestined is the word prohorizo. It's made up of, it's a compound word, pro, before, and horizo, from which we get our word horizon. It's the Greek word for to see or to view. So here we're looking at predestined is to see ahead of time. It appears six times in the Greek New Testament. No word translated predestined appears in the Old Testament. Predestination is not even a prominent theme in the Bible. The word faith appears 475 times in the English Standard Version, ESV. The English word predestined appears only five times. So whatever predestination is, God's not making a big deal out of it. And all five occurrences of that English word predestined occur only in the New Testament, never in the Old Testament. The word means to come to a decision beforehand, to determine ahead of time, to decide upon ahead of time. So the question is this, do these five New Testament verses indicate precisely what was decided beforehand? Well, let's look at them. Acts 4.28 God had determined to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. This is in reference to the cross of Christ. So here's no reference to predestination to salvation. Rather, it's the cross of Christ which God predestined, God decided in advance would take place. Number two, Romans 8, 29 and 30, we've already looked at it. What is it people are predestined to? To be conformed to the image of God's Son. They're not predestined to salvation. Ephesians 1, 5 on page 6. He predestined us to the adoption of sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His own will. What is pre, are we predestined to? They're not salvation, but the benefits of final salvation. Notice the concept of adoption. So we are informed, believers are informed, that they've been predestined to obtain an inheritance. That's final glorification. So predestination refers to what occurs to believers or what they receive, not how they become believers. So in summary, predestination refers to five things. God predestined the cross of Christ. Believers are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. Believers are predestined to be called justified and glorified. Believers are predestined for adoption. And believers are predestined to obtain an inheritance. Predestination does not refer to God electing some people to go to heaven and some to go to hell. Predestination does not refer to God electing some people to salvation and others to damnation. Predestination does refer to those already saved. God determines those already saved will reach final salvation. Now I submit to you that 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 analysis makes perfect sense and is commensurate and compatible with what Scripture teaches. And that is a way to understand all of this apart from Calvinism. You don't have to uh, understand it in a Calvinistic framework. 
So let's quickly talk about foreknowledge. Obviously, Romans 8, 29 links foreknowledge and predestination. So let's just talk logically for a minute together. Okay, number one, you tell me, does God foreknow all things, yes or no? Of course he does. If he didn't, he wouldn't be God. So everybody can agree, God foreknows all things. Next, can God foreknow all things without causing all things? Okay, I'm going to ask that again. Can God foreknow all things without directly causing all things to occur? Of course he can. The answer is yes. He can do that. All right, next. Faith is a condition of salvation. Is that statement true or is it false? You're getting better at this. Yes, faith is a condition of salvation. A hundred times in the New Testament, how are we saved? For by grace are you saved through faith. Paul to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. A hundred times in the New Testament, God has annexed a condition on anybody being saved. What is that condition? Say it with me. Faith in Christ. All right, let's do that one more time. God has annexed a condition on salvation. Salvation is not unconditional. God has annexed a condition on salvation. And that condition is, say it with me, three words, faith in Christ. Right? Now, does God foresee the faith of all people who believe, yes or no? Yes, of course he does. Does God foreknow and foresee, regardless of whether God bases election on that or not, take that off the table. Does God know who's going to believe and who's not going to believe, yes or no? Yes. He does. Is foreseen faith then necessarily the ground of salvation? It could be, but it's not necessary that that's the case. Is foreseen faith the ground of salvation? No. Is foreseen faith the ground of election? Some say yes, it is the ground of election those non-Calvinists who believe that foreseen faith is what God uses to determine who are his elect, they do believe this. So the answer to this question is some say yes. Right? Now, another statement. God foreknows all things that will be. Is that, yes, is that a yes or is that a no? Yes. Nothing will be because he foreknows it. Nothing will be because God foreknows it, because foreknow does not mean foreordain. Because, just because God foreknows what's going to happen doesn't mean that God is the cause of what happens. Now, be careful here. God could foreknow what's going to happen because he does cause things to happen, and God does indeed cause things to happen. You don't want to make the mistake of saying that libertarian freedom means that God never causes anything to happen. Of course God causes things to happen. And God stops things from happening. And God answers prayer. And God intervenes in life. So we're not saying that God never does any of that. But the point we're making is that the fact that God foreknows everything that is going to occur does not mean that God foreordains and causes everything to occur. That's what the Calvinist teaches, at least by secondary causes, that humanity does it and they're culpable, not God. But God is the ultimate sovereign, and therefore he's ultimately the cause of all things. Now, let's stop right there real quick. We're almost through before we get to questions. Let me point this out. Now, think with me. Just stay with me five more minutes. I know this is different. It's a lot different than what we did this morning, right? I would never do this in a Sunday morning sermon, right? It's a classroom, not a sermon, right? 
But I want you to think about this. Everything that occurs, good, bad, or indifferent, everything good and everything that's the most evil, Hitler on the place of the planet, everything that occurs, occurs because God at the very least permits it to occur and God could, if he chose, stop it from occurring. Is that true or false? That is true. That's absolutely true. So if you want to get really nitpicky with me and say, well now, David, even everything that happens, including all the Hitlers in the world, uh, God's permitted that, and, and therefore God's involved. Well, in that sense, yes, God created the universe. There'd be nothing, period, if God didn't do it. So, okay. But that's not the point. The point is, when people choose moral evil, is, that, is God culpable for that? And the answer to that is no. Because of libertarian freedom, we would argue, as non-Calvinists. So, for no does not mean foreordain. It does not mean that. So the object of predestination, bottom of page 6, is not faith, it's not salvation, at least in the sense of entering salvation, being by, by means of regeneration, justification, etc. I would argue the object of predestination is glorification. That's what Scripture says God has predestined us to. It's very, at least a, a, a legitimate understanding of the concept of, of predestination or election. So, I would say that foreseen faith need not be the condition of election. It may be. You say, well, David, I believe it is. You're in good company. You've got a lot of people who do. Uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I believe it is. And on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I'm not so convinced. I waffle back and forth on this one. But one thing is clear. It is certainly a legitimate interpretation to say that the doctrine of election in the Bible is God elects those that he foreknows will believe in Christ. That's a legitimate interpretation. You may disagree with it. All Calvinists disagree with that. But it is an interpretation. You may say, I don't agree with it. I think that's wrong. But it is a legitimate interpretation. But now think about it this way. Foreseen faith need not be the condition of election. However, faith is the condition of salvation. Right? So faith is the condition of justification. And if God decrees that faith is the condition of salvation, why could he not decree it's also the condition of election? And the answer is he could do that. And there are many Christians who say that he did. Election is not the less sovereign if conditioned upon foreknowledge of faith. It's not any less sovereign if it is based on what God foreknows. If God honors faith so much as to make it the convict condition and vehicle of justification in time, how could it possibly distract from God's honor if he took that into consideration in the counsels of eternity? If God foreordained the plan of redemption, why might he not predetermine salvation in view of human faith? There's no reason God can't do that. So Arminianism that argues that that is how God did it They've got a legitimate point to make. That could very well be how God does it. Foreknowledge no more determines a person's actions than afterknowledge. You heard about the Aggie who bet on the football game and lost, and then he bet on the rerun and lost again. Sorry, my apologies. That was ugly. I, that was. I had not said anything ugly until today, till now. I'm in the wrong church for that. How about okay? Well, how about if I, I? How about if we just talk about Longhorns then? They're the ones. All right. Forget I said Aggies. Just go to Longhorns. Okay. I'll do that even though my son was a graduate of UT. Okay. I'll still do that. Longhorns. Right. Okay. Forgiven, forgive, forgive, kiss and make up, okay? <laughs> Look, 
foreknowledge no more determines a person's actions than after knowledge. If you watch the game recorded after it's already been played, the fact that you're watching it and there's a recording of it has nothing to do with what happened on the field. What happens on the recording did not cause what happened on the field. And if you were God and knew what was going to happen on the field because you are God, that no more entails that you caused that to happen any more than the after knowledge caused it to happen. Do you follow? So it's a confusion of categories to mix foreknowledge with causation. Okay. Now, okay, 631, there you go. I got through everything I wanted to get through on this subject of election, predestination, and for knowledge. Wow, okay, that was, that was a lot, I agree. But what do you say we take a few questions, and I'll just walk down here and stand at the front so I can hear you better and see you better, uh, and uh, I'll just I'll bring these down here too, and uh, I guess we'll just operate what? Just raise your hand and... And uh, we'll go from there. So let me get down here where I can put this down here. All right. Or are we using a mic for anybody? Or you going to do a handheld mic? Okay. Yeah, just so everybody can hear, if you have a question, let me ask you, just raise your hand and the mic will be brought to you. We'll take about 30 minutes now. We go to seven, I think, on this, if I remember. Yeah, if we need to, if there are that many questions, if not. Uh, you can go home and watch Columbo or whatever is on tonight. Okay. Who uh, You got a question or, or, or a comment or whatever, you know. If you want to say, David, you know, I think you are totally wrong and you are, you're just an idiot, you don't understand, and here's why. You're not going to offend me, okay? You got a question or a comment? Over here, this lady, over here. <coughs> Yeah, just hold it up close when you speak, everybody. Hold it up okay. close. My question may not be one, and it's real important, but John the Baptist, do you believe that or did he sacrifice his teaching? He knew in the womb that Jesus was going to be the Savior. So, all right, so that, right, that's a statement, but do you have a question related to that? Related or? To Oh, yeah, there, well, there's no question that God predetermined that Jesus is coming. And so that, that, right, there's no question that God caused and predetermined that the Messiah was going to come through the nation of Israel. And God orchestrated a number of things in history to bring that about, but yet God is orchestrating that through the free will of his creatures to bring about the cross of Christ. Correct. He chose John the Baptist to be the forerunner of the Messiah. That is correct. And, but notice, that's not predestination to salvation. That's, again, predestination to service, which is what most of all the predestination in the Old Testament is about service. God elects the nation of Israel. Why? Because they're special? No, for service. They, it would be through the nation of Israel the Messiah comes. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. All right, anybody else? Okay, here, back here. We got a question back here. He's going to run and get you, get there. <laughs> oh, okay. So, have you heard of Molinism? Yes, I have. I was hoping you wouldn't bring that up because that's about the most complicated thing in the universe, but. Uh, we'll make a stab at it. So, so uh, to the last question, John the Baptist as being, you know, his role that God had for him, you know, although his salvation wasn't predetermined, but he still had to have free will, correct? Right. Yep, that's the, right. 
That's the question of, that, right, that Albert Molina, who's a Catholic philosopher in the 17th century, and what's come to be called Molinism, is a philosophical way of trying to explain how is it that God not only knows what will happen, but how does God know all the possible things that could happen? And he has a rather complicated way it, it, of talking about what's called middle knowledge. And the bottom line is, whether Molinism is true or not true, uh, or, the, or the mechanism, whether the mechanism is accurate or inaccurate that Molina came up with, the bottom line is, if God is God, then he not only knows what does happen, or, and what will happen, but he also knows all possible plays in all possible worlds given all possible circumstances. And Molina said that God knew that because God has middle, middle knowledge, he calls it middle, middle knowledge of conditionals based, that Molina was attempting to justify free will to argue against the Calvinists who said you don't really have free will because the reason, Calvinists argue, the reason God knows what's going to occur, why? Is because God has determined that's going to occur. That's how God can know everything. Molina said, God knows everything because he's God. He knows anyway, but he doesn't have to know it because he determines it. He knows all possible scenarios and what would occur, what people would do or could do in those scenarios, but God himself also knows what people will do in those scenarios. And therefore, there's a sense in which what God does know ahead of time is going to occur, but that doesn't mean that what God knows is going to occur, he knows because he ordained it to occur, because he caused it to occur. That's a different issue. Oh, absolutely. All non-Calvinists argue that God is sovereign and humanity has free will. With one exception, there's a small group of people who are involved in doctrinal error, and I would argue it's heresy. It's called open theism, and that's a fancy term that means uh, man has free will, but God can't know everything that's going to happen. He can guess at it, predict it, but he can get some of it right, that's why you have prophecy, but he just can't know everything because he can't know the, the future choices of free creatures and therefore there, God is open to the future. He doesn't fully know everything. Now, most non-Calvinists uh, argue that's either gross error or it's actual heresy. There are very few that would hold that point of view, but there are some non-Calvinists that would hold that point of view but there would be a minority that would hold that point of view. Would it be correct in you saying that some of these, some of this is finite knowledge and not middle knowledge? Absolutely. Yeah, to some extent, some of this is the finite human mind trying to understand the mind and actions of the infinite God. And there will always be breakdown in that. Nobody, Calvinist or non-Calvinist, nobody's got this all figured out. Nobody. That, that is correct. That's why these questions that we're discussing now have been debated for 2,000 years. Been argued about by Christians for 2,000 years. At least lots of these have. Who's next? Yes, sir. Yeah, there is no point in it. Well, first of all, I want to be fair to my Calvinist brothers and sisters. They would all agree with you that there is no grounds for any Calvinist to be an elitist. Now, unfortunately, some of them are, because I deal with them all the time, especially students. Every now and then I'll have a Calvinist student who thinks I'm so badly wrong that I'm barely saved. Now, and I'm not kidding you. There are some people who are so committed to their system that if you don't agree with their system, you're probably unsaved. But now that's a very rare minority. Again, I don't want to, I don't want to broad brush our Calvinist brothers, 
But there are some that are very elitist, and they're very arrogant. And their own leaders talk about that with them. I've, I've got, you can see articles written by John Piper telling these young Calvinist boys, quit being so arrogant. Now that's not a non-Calvinist telling them that. That's a Calvinist telling them that, you know. There's no ground. And of all people, Calvinists believe, hey, it's all by grace and God chose me. I had nothing to do with it. So therefore you have no grounds to be proud is the whole point. Of all people who shouldn't be proud, uh, about it, it should be the Calvinist because of their doctrine of unconditional election. But by the way, that should be true of all of us. It doesn't matter who we are, Calvinist or not, you've got no grounds to be proud. Your salvation is by grace. All right? Yes, ma'am. Jesus didn't know what he was going to do, or is Jesus just making an example of him? Um, I guess the point is, what is, how do you be an evangelist? What is the point of it other than, I've, I've heard what they say about Jesus, right. Jesus doing what God tells him. So what's the point of that? All right, let me answer that from a Calvinist perspective, and then let me answer it from a non-Calvinist perspective. The Calvinist would say to you, that God ordains the ends and he also ordains the means to the end. And the means to the end is evangelism. And therefore all Christians should constantly be sharing Christ and preaching the gospel and witnessing because it's through that means that God calls out his elect. And obviously by definition the elect are going to be saved at some point in time. God knows when that is. But all of the elect are going to be saved. According to Calvinism, the elect cannot fail to be saved. They're going to be saved. Right? So all Calvinists would say to you, uh, they would say that, number one, and then they would say, number two, this. Calvinists believe in what, what, we, what they call two kinds of calls to the unsaved. There is the general call. The general call is the call that goes out every time you witness to somebody or every time the pastor preaches or I preach or any preacher preaches. Anytime the gospel is presented, the general call goes out to all people, elect and non-elect. But Calvinists also teach there is a second call. It is called the effectual call. And Calvinists teach that when the effectual call goes out to the elect, that God regenerates the elect and grants them the gift of faith so that at that point they can believe, and they always do believe. And thus they are regenerated, they are justified, sanctified, and then ultimately they will be glorified. And therefore Calvinist would say the general call goes to everybody, and that's why we preach. And that's why we do evangelism. But the effectual call is only known to God, by God. It only goes to the elect. And God's going to use your general call. And in that general call, there'll be some that will be called effectually. The word effectual means it is going to occur, no stopping it. And so the elect, according to God's timetable, at some point in their life are going to receive the, the special call or the effectual call, and they are going to be granted regeneration, and then granted the gift of faith. They can, they can believe when they're regenerated, they can now believe. But those of us who are non-Calvinists will say, well, that's all fine and good, but once they're regenerated and granted the gift of faith, can they choose not to believe with that gift? And the answer is no. That's the irresistible grace. We haven't gotten there yet. But you see, God's effectual call is irresistible. You can't not believe when the effectual call comes. But Calvinists say, even though that's true, they say, but the point's not that. It's you want to believe. Nobody doesn't want to believe when they are regenerated and they're granted the gift of faith. They, they now, their eyes are open and they want to believe. And thus they choose to believe. But the non-Calvinist says, 
well, that doesn't sound like genuine libertarian freedom to us, and it doesn't. I don't think it is. Uh, but I'm just, you know, I'm just answering, answering your question first the way a Calvinist would answer it. Uh, unless, now there's only one caveat, only one nuance to that answer. If a person is what is called a hyper-Calvinist, hyper-Calvinist are a small group of, Calvin, of all Calvinists, right? And hyper-Calvinists believe that because of limited atonement, because Jesus only died for the sins of the elect, then it is disingenuous to preach the gospel to everybody. I'm sorry, it's disingenuous to offer salvation to everybody because God is only offering salvation to the elect through the effectual call. Now, so hyper-Calvinists argue you preach to everybody but don't offer salvation to any. God's going to do that for his elect and then you recognize them by virtue of their faith and then you follow through and disciple them and so forth. That's called hyper-Calvinism. And that brand of Calvinism is uh, not very evangelistic, to put it mildly. But that brand of Calvinism is condemned by all other Calvinists as well, as well as non-Calvinists. Correct, yeah, there's, yeah, there are other implications, even Calvinists that are not hyper-Calvinists, by virtue of their doctrine of unconditional election, the total depravity, irresistible grace, they don't want to give public altar calls. Well, the, the, call, the call is the preaching of the gospel, let's talk about that first. But then the altar call, right, that now a pastor is calling people and offering salvation to all, and right, hyper-Calvinists particularly, and some Calvinists don't want to do a public altar call. I, I think it's just contra... Well, in a sense, that's, in a sense, I think you're right, in other words, if, if Calvinism is true, if unconditional election is true, then it doesn't matter whether you give an altar call or not, the people that God wants saved are going to get saved, period. And that's the whole point. That's why they argue against, many of them argue against altar calls. Others argue that it's manipulation. Now, I don't think a legitimate altar call, I've always in all my pastorates given public invitations, just like we did this morning. For 22 years, every church I pastored, I gave a public invitation or what's called a public altar call. I don't think that as long as that's done with integrity and as long as you don't get up there and do what my friend did on Christmas Day when I went back home when I was a young pastor and I had, he was staying in town and I was going back to visit family in Georgia and I asked him to preach for me in my church on, on Christmas Day and on that day in Dallas, it was about 1983 or something like that, and it was that particular Christmas, it was so cold, I mean it was terribly cold, and the heat wasn't working right in our church, it was frigid in there, and he got up and preached on Christmas Day for an hour, and then gave a public invitation, and they sang 16 stanzas of Just As I Am, and he said, you're not, unless, until somebody comes, we're not closing down this invitation. Now, by the way, I never invited him back, and by the way, when I got back on my, from that trip, my people said, Pastor, we love you. Don't ever invite that guy back. You know? And so that's an obvious example of manipulation. You know? And you can easily do that. But that doesn't negate the reality of an altar call. You can manipulate a sermon. Right? But that doesn't mean we don't need to preach sermons. So, good question. Yes, sir. So is Right. What's the role of the Holy Spirit? Okay. Here's the answer. The role of the Holy Spirit is in regenerating the elect. So when the effectual call goes out, the Holy Spirit is the one who comes upon the elect and regenerates them. 
they, the term that is used there in a monergistic fashion. God alone does it. God the Holy Spirit does the work of regeneration, which, by the way, non-Calvinists believe that God the Holy Spirit also does the work of regeneration. There's no difference there between us. But they, the, the, the viewpoint is that the work of the Holy Spirit, he regenerates the, the heart of the elect, and then he grants them, works in them to grant them the gift of faith. And now based on the death of Christ for their sins, because they're among the elect, the Holy Spirit has granted them the gift of faith, and therefore they do believe, hence irresistible grace. They will believe. They cannot not believe. They have to believe. But there is the role of the Holy, the Holy Spirit does the work of regeneration. That, by the way, is just a, 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 that is an orthodox Christian doctrine, whether you're Calvinist or non-Calvinist, the argument is over does God do the work of regeneration prior to your faith. Scripture indicates that faith leads to regeneration, not vice versa. Correct, because you can be convicted and still not be saved. Exactly. You can have conviction, but not, uh, not saving faith. Correct. Saving faith. Faith in Christ is saving faith, and that's what saves. Yes, sir, over here. Uh, you know, in other words, if I understand, let me paraphrase and see if I've got your question correctly. You're saying if someone dies and they've never believed in Christ and they die, does that mean that they were among the non-elect? Is that what you're asking? The answer is yes. Yeah, if someone dies without Christ, then there is no hope after death. All Orthodox Christians believe that too. So, if, by the way, we're talking not about an infant. We're, we're, oh, we're not talking about somebody who's mentally challenged. We're talking about a person who's mentally and physically healthy. They live their life. They have the wherewithal to understand right and wrong. And they die without receiving Christ. Do they? What happens to them? Well, the Bible says they do not go to heaven. They do go to hell. And the Bible says that obviously they were an unbeliever and therefore Calvinism would say they are among the non-elect. And, and by the way, even non-Calvinists would say that because by definition in the New Testament, the word elect is always used to describe all saved people. And so if a person dies unsaved, that's true. They're not, they're not elect. They're not elect to make it to final salvation because they never were in Christ. But they're not elect because God didn't choose them. They're not elect because they rejected Christ. There's a difference. Are these Calvinists saying that they believe they were in with Christ when they died? Yes, they do. Calvinists, generally speaking, are very, take very seriously the role of discipleship. This was true of the Puritans. If you read the lives of the Puritans, most of them were Calvinists, not all of them. There were some Arminian Puritans. They were in the minority. Most Puritans were Calvinists. But they, the Puritans, for example, took very seriously the importance of discipleship for new believers. Absolutely. And, but so do non-Calvinists, or at least should. All Christians should take that seriously. After we're saved, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, discipleship. Discipleship. We got time for a couple of more. You're doing great. You're doing great. All right, I see a hand back here. So, so how can or the how can a Calvinist have peace that he is one of the elect? Many don't. That's a part of the problem with their doctrine of perseverance of the saints. Because they look, they wind up. Some Calvinists wind up looking for evidences that they're elect. That's what caused the Puritans, many of them, to become so morbidly introspective that they never could have any peace. And some Calvinists will actually tell you, you really can't know uh, that you're elect until you actually get to heaven. Then you can know, but up to the moment of your death, you really can't know. Now, I I think the Scripture clearly teaches you can have assurance of your salvation in this life. Because it's not based on whether you have signs of election. It's based on what Christ promises. 
You come to me, I'll never cast you out. And so you can have assurance based on what Christ said without trying to look, do I have all the evidences of being elect like some people in history have tried to do. How, how pervasive is the problem of Southern Baptist Church? Well, um, and this is gaining or is it grading? Well, for the last 20 years it's been gaining ground in Southern Baptist life. There are many reasons for that. Uh, first is the influence of some key leaders, both non-Southern Baptists and Southern Baptists, who have influenced the younger generation of college and seminary students. So John MacArthur is a big example. R.C. Sproul was a big influencer. And then people like uh, John Piper, big influencer. Uh, people like... Uh, 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 Al Moeller, president of Southern Seminary, big influencer. Uh, people like Mark Dever, pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in D.C., a big, big influencer. Uh, and there's uh, J.I. Packer, who just died a year or two ago uh, from England, big influencer. The, all these people are five-point Calvinists, and they were all very, all uh, either were or are, those that are living, and they're, they're all very influential. And so many of the young college students were saved under the Passion Ministry, the Passion Conferences, and were taught all those teachers at Passion Conferences are Calvinists, and they're basically teaching Calvinism. And then they wind up going to Southern Seminary, and Southern Seminary is very Calvinistic. And some of the other seminaries are becoming more and more uh, Calvinistic because the professors are now 10, 20 years into this. They were young they were 20-year-olds 20, 20 years ago, and they were influenced, and now they're 40-year-olds, and they have their Ph.D., and they're coming in to teach, and they're coming in as Calvinists. And so there is a growing Calvinism within the Southern Baptist Convention. And then they go out into churches, and they go out as youth ministers. And Pat, churches aren't very careful sometimes of clearly identifying where potential staff members are, what they believe. They don't interview them carefully enough. They don't ask them, look, do you, are you a Calvinist? What kind of a Calvinist? Do you affirm limited atonement or not? How are you going to operate here? And so they come in and they start teaching the teenagers. And they start teaching them John, everything John Piper wrote. And the teenagers are impressed. And John Piper's brilliant. And they're all of a sudden they're all converted to Calvinism. And then their pastor, who's not a Calvinist, winds up and teaches something that's contrary to Calvinism. And all the, all the teenagers are saying to mom and dad, you know, our pastor's wrong there. Well, what do you mean he's wrong? Well, he's teaching this and this is not. Well, what, where are you getting that? Well, John Piper says, and now you got churches split over that. Now, that, what I just described is happening in hundreds of Southern Baptist churches. Hundreds of them. Because they call me. I, I can tell you a hundred examples of this kind of thing where, you know. Now, the Calvinists will say, hey, look, it's not our fault that y'all are non-Calvinists. You know, they believe their view is true. So we're the ones that are wrong theologically and that's why they don't have any problem coming in and teaching. They believe it's true. But the church doesn't or the pastor doesn't or, it, or they call a pastor who's a Calvinist and then he begins to move the church to a Calvinistic understanding of things. He begins to move the church from a traditional congregationalism to an elder-led church. And then that elder led, they don't mean for it to happen, but it osmosis is, that's not a word probably, but a verb, but, but you wind up by virtue of osmosis, the elder, elder led becomes elder rule. So now you've got six men in the church that run everything. You have no more business meetings, and they can hire and fire, and you don't have anything to say about it, and that's a Presbyterian model of church government. It's not a Baptist model. And that kind of thing is happening all through our churches as well. So it is, it is a problem. I mean, I'm just being candid. Now, the Calvinist who is here, is, who's listening to all this, is just steaming. I mean, he, he's just mad because he said, well, that, that's not the whole story. And, and, you know, you, and, and so he'd want to get up here and rebut all that, right? But I'm just telling you, I've been around a few. Uh, I didn't fall off the turnip truck yesterday. I just sound like I did. But I've been around Southern Baptist churches a long time, preached in lots of them, taught many students 
over the last 30, 35 years, and there's a growing Calvinism among the younger generation. I'm just telling you, you know, it's, it's happening. There are many reasons. I just named a few. Those aren't the only reasons, but they're, they're, those are some reasons. Okay? I do. You got high profile leaders who are Calvinists. It's, it's, it's an argument from authority. Right. When people see them yeah. in position of authority. Right. They respect their and they respect their authority. And, and, and default, they right. Call them yeah, authority. exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, my professor is a Calvinist. Al right. Mohler was a Calvinist. Or my whatever. Uh, and, and, and they write all the books, and therefore uh, they, they must be right, and boom, before you know it, they're converted. Well, they will argue it's absolutely Scripture-based, yeah, but, but I would argue, I, I talked to a lot of Calvinist students, I had one, I remember one one time in my office, and I said, uh, do you believe in limited atonement, that Jesus died only for the sins of the elect? Uh, yes. And I said, well, let me just ask you, and I showed him five verses in Scripture that say that Jesus died for the sins of the world. I say, do those verses believe, that, say, teach, do you believe those verses teach that Jesus died for the sins of the world? He said, yes. I said, so you don't believe in limited atonement? He said, no, I do believe in limited atonement. I said, well, in light of Scripture, why? And he bald flakes told me because John Piper does. And yet he admitted, yeah, uh, those verses don't teach limited atonement. They actually teach unlimited atonement. Now, that's an, uh, you know, a Calvinist would say, yeah, but that's just one stupid example. You're choosing one example, and there are a lot of us who read our Bible better than you do. Well, okay, fine. That, but I'm just pointing out that some of this is chalked up to the influence of an authority in a young life, and they haven't yet fully work through their theology and they kind of fall they fall into it and it's it's uh, everybody talks about it and the books are written about it and the conferences are held and it, it makes logical sense my goodness the tulip it just makes perfect sense and so how how have all these years how is it that my pastor is so dumb he doesn't understand this and I'm just telling you that's the mindset of some not everybody but but some okay Right here, and then we'll probably, I don't want to keep you longer than you want to be kept. So what do we do with all this information? Are we doing it about Calvinism because at, at the very bottom of it, we can see the word atonement or save? Because I haven't met anyone, I mean, everyone I know that was born to a Calvinist did not originate that way. They kind of graduated into it. That's a good point. And Well, part, partly so. I would not say that Calvinism is a false gospel. Now, you will hear me say tomorrow that I do believe that the doctrine of limited atonement is a distortion of the gospel. And I will say, I've said that for 15 years, and it irritates Calvinists to affirm limited atonement, but I do believe that with all my heart. But what we're doing today is trying to communicate sound doctrine. And there is room for debate on some of these issues. In my opinion, there's less room for debate on some. But there is room for debate on some of these issues. Uh, but, but either way, Christians need to understand the basic issues. That's why your pastor wanted to have this conference. And that's why I'm here. You know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not just interested in debating people. I don't, I'm not here just because somebody wants to debate uh, at all. I mean, I'm happy to debate if they want to. But basically, Calvinists are very good about presenting their understanding. And so I'm just simply trying to say, here's the other side of that picture. And Christians need to understand both. So then you make decisions of what you believe. Right. Good question. Well, that if, that if a Calvinist is that clear or blatant about it, yes, that, because 
But see, they won't do that. What they'll do, what they do, is they're going to preach the gospel. And most of them, they may not have a public altar call, but they're going to say in their sermon, you need to believe in Christ. Believe in Christ and you will be saved. Now, what they mean by that, when they preach that, is those of you who do believe, you are among the elect and you are given the effectual call and therefore you have believed. They're not going to go into all of that detail in their sermon, but they believe that. But they're still going to preach the gospel, which they should, and people can be saved under Calvinist. It's the gospel that's saved. Doesn't matter whether it's a Calvinist or non-Calvinist. Either one who preaches the gospel faithfully, God uses his gospel to save people. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Pastor, thank you very much. We've got a great start. Don't miss tomorrow. Let me answer your question about why are we doing this. My job is, as or one of my jobs as a pastor, is to protect the flock from confusion. The Bible says that there should not be confusion within the flock. Now, for 127 years, uh, this has been our doctrine in this church. We're not Calvinists. Uh, I can provide you a copy of our Constitution and bylaws where our Articles of Faith describe the free will of man. Uh, your free moral agents to make a decision. I don't remember who it was back here mentioned the uh, rich young ruler. Scripture says he went away sorrowful. He was under conviction probably. The Holy Spirit was telling him what Jesus said was right, and he needed to, he needed to do that, but he wasn't willing to give up his sin in order for the Savior. That's a choice. He had a choice there. And so there's people today that don't think they have a choice. Now, I want to say a few things that I have the privilege to say that he can't say, okay? Uh, I have no respect whatsoever for preachers that will come into a church that know what that church believes and lie to a pulpit committee, lie to the deacons, and then start working their magic. It usually starts off this way. Uh, they start, they get them a little group within the church that they're discipling. They get them to go in with them. Then they, the first thing they do is they get rid of the old people. Here locally, they've used contemporary music to do that. They basically run off anybody that really knows the scriptures and tries to get rid of them. And it doesn't bother them to get rid of them. Okay? You know what? That... Six things God hates, yea, seven are abominations, so in discord among the brethren is one of them. And a preacher is guilty, if you're guilty as a preacher, of so in discord among the brethren intentionally, God don't like that. Third step, go from congregational rule to elder rule. Most Southern Baptists don't even have a clue what that means. But elder rule means a handful of people run the church and choose the doctrine. You as congregants lose control of what you believe. A handful of people choose that. And then they start making it public then about what we believe. We believe this is different. Uh, now, you say, well, I just don't think that go on. It's gone on in this association for some time now. Is that not true, Andy? You've seen it. So my job is to make sure that you understand what we believe here. Now, have I had people in doctrinal disagreement with that? Yes. Yes. Can we tolerate certain disagreements? Yes. It's like eschatology or the study of end time. Uh, I know some of you are not premillennial, but you have the right to be wrong, okay? If, if you want to go through the tribulation, line up for it, okay? I really want to go out sooner than that. Now, that's my view, but now here's the thing. You know, I don't see eschatology as an as a issue of fellowship. Uh, Brother Ron, uh, he was a historic premillennialist. That's a little different than a pre-tribulationist premillennial, which is what I am. Uh, I've known of all millennials. Those are not issues of fellowship. We can disagree on those things. But when it comes to dealing with the doctrine of salvation and that Jesus didn't die for everybody, that can greatly confuse people. You know why? 
because there's a lot of people that are really lost and they think that they're beyond the grasp of God. The truth is no one is beyond the grasp of God. Nobody. So if we put doubts in people's minds, I was telling Dr. Allen today at lunch, a, a professor I had at Southwestern when I was there would tell about his mama who was a hard shell. That means they were Calvinists. All her life, he remembered her praying and begging and pleading with God for the illumination. That is that, would you call it, not the general call, but the, uh, the effectual call. It's when, you, it's when you become knowledgeable, okay, God chose me. But she never got it. And the woman died. She went to her death believing that she was lost. Even though he said every night, he said, when we would gather around for prayer in the living room, he said, and she raised them all in church. And she would plead and weep for God to, to let her be a part of the elect. But she never had, she went to her grave believing she was lost. Guess what kind of, pre, what kind of a professor he was? Evangelism professor. Because he had been set free from all that. So here's the thing. I, why are we doing it? My job is to teach you uh, the ins and outs of it. He's done that. He does more about it than I, I could ever do. If I was to explain in a wider way tonight, here's what I'd say. He predestined the plan of salvation. Now, that's a radical over, or oversimplification, okay? But he predestined a plan by which we get saved. It involved Jesus. It involved the cross. It involved us surrendering to him. He predestined that plan. And he foreknew who would be saved. And that may be all an oversimplification of what we believe, but... Uh, but hopefully it will help you. But we need to know what we believe, and we need to raise up generations of kids that don't go off to college and get all messed up. Okay? Now, with that, please come back tomorrow night and bring somebody with you. We're not going to burn a Calvinist at the stake. Uh, we're not going to be ugly about this. I'm going to do my best to be controlled about some of it. But I'll tell you, uh, <laughs> I've sat through some stuff as a pastor where I've just said, oh, help me, help me, help me. Uh, I went to an associational meeting some years ago. To, I was invited to come to this meeting of leaders to help. And one of them, who I knew was a Calvinist, jumped on me and was real rude and ugly to me. Who asked you to come? And blah, 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 blah. And I finally, after trying to reason with him and help him understand why I'd been invited to come and speak to him, I finally told him, well, I was just predestined to be here today, brother. And you were predestined to listen. And I was predestined to leave just as soon as I can after I deliver this information to you. And he shut up. Because, see, if you really believe what he says he believes, he wouldn't have been asking those questions that way. He would have just accepted, God's brought this man here to help us in this time. Okay, so let's let's don't be ugly about it. I'm not trying to teach you to hate people or be mad at people, but can I tell you something? I mean, I'm, I'm I'll soon be 59 years old. I don't know how long the Lord will let me stay here. I don't know how long you'll let me stay here. But to quote a lot of old preachers that disciple me, leave a place better than you found it. Well, here's the truth. I found it in pretty good shape. It was in excellent shape when I received it. And I don't want to leave it to a generation of folks that don't know up from down when it comes to theology. So understand that that's my heart, is to, to make sure that the future generation knows what we believe here. Okay? Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you for the time tonight to uh, study your word and understand the interpretations that have been so well explained. Lord, I know that some of this is very deep uh, theology. It's far beyond my understanding. And Lord, I know that sometimes it felt uh, today that, you know, we, we question, why are we studying about other people and what they're doing? But the same is today, we need to see and know and understand that we can stand strong and give a defense of our faith. 
Lord, I pray that uh, as we go forth from here that we would reach out to others within the congregation, Lord, and maybe even friends and invite them to be here tomorrow night. We pray for uh, a good understanding of these issues, Lord, that we may be firmly committed to sharing the faith. I pray, Father, for your goodness to rest upon uh, uh, the Howe family tonight, Lord. And, Father, we ask now for you to encourage them and strengthen them during these difficult times. Lord, bless these that have gathered here tonight, Lord, and bless uh, Dr. Allen for his leadership. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Don't forget the love offering and don't forget the books out in the colonnade.